OK, so that's recording started. So whoever's eating, that's now getting recorded. It's great. Hmm. All right, this, as you know, is governance, risk and compliance. Um, today is just an introduction. So what we're going to do is we take you through, you know, what actually is governance, risk and compliance. What it is you're going to have to do and what you're going to have to come up with uh, for the assessment. Uh, like I say, it's a very small class. Feel free to chip in. Feel free to ask questions. Don't wait. Don't um, don't save them up. Just just chat. OK, so. Hopefully you will have seen Moodle. Oh, actually, can I just check? I'm assuming I have properly shared my screen. You're seeing this. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, thank you. So I'm assuming you've all been on to Moodle and you've all found the Moodle site. Yes. Yes. Yeah. OK, so. What I always do is I don't hide anything. So everything that we are going to do is on Moodle and it's on Moodle from now. There'll be no surprises. There'll be nothing new added unless I have uh, not explained something well and you ask for a clarification, in which case I'll update it. But everything's there. OK, so I'm not going to hide things. I'm not suddenly go ha ha and I have something extra being added. So everything that's there now is exactly what you're going to need. Uh, I know some of you use uh, small <coughs> devices like phones and and um, and tablets. I'm going to do it on the PC, and I would encourage you, even if it's only occasionally, you go onto the PC because what I do is I have the things coming up. So, for example, you'll see that there's an upcoming event here. That's something that you have to do, and it closes this Friday. So there's a date against it, and you know when you have to do it. Hence the big arrow. Anything that's coming up, I'll try and put on the calendar and so you know exactly what's coming up and when. That said, I'm not expecting many things, <coughs> excuse me, to be on there other than uh, the final assessment itself. But we'll see. So as I say, everything is on there. It's all split up into different sections. Now, as I'm showing you this, uh, you will see things on my screen that you haven't seen. So for example, the subject panel sample pack is our stupid name for last year's results. So not surprisingly, I've hidden that from you, but it's up there so that uh, our external examiners can see it. So if you see something different, it's not because I'm doing something weird, it's because I've hidden some things for you because it's just for lectures. So don't worry about it. Everything is in these sections. So everything that we're going to do is in these sections. Some of the sections have a hash against them. Those are things that you need to know, but I am not going to cover. Basically, they are copies of uh, the sections from professional computing practice last year that covered uh, legislation. And in fact, that thing up there was, did you do professional computing practice? Now, normally people wander through, they do the level nine stuff and then they move into level 10. But I know that sometimes people join us in level 10, so I just want to get a, an idea. So just for now, has anyone not done the professional computing practice module? Yep, so you've all done it, so you're all good. Somebody's need to switch their phone, it's a bit. I know, it's very <laughs> bingy, isn't it? I am not, I can't concentrate when I hear noises. I think it's you, Angela. <laughs> that probably is me. <laughs> well, every time I hear the bing, I get a wee circle around your picture on the screen, which suggests that you're speaking, but of course it's not a speaker, it's a, it's a bing. It's a noise. Yeah, that or it's Samuel, hard to tell. <laughs> 
Did I introduce myself? I don't think I did. My name's Tony Gardney. By the way, if you haven't met before, I know some of us have met, but my name's Tony Gardney, so nice to meet you if you haven't met before. OK, so. This is the stuff that we'll be covering. The stuff with a hash against it is stuff that you should know and should be included, but we're not going to cover it. That said, if you've forgotten anything, ask the question. OK, so there's things in there that you've forgotten about, just let me know. But it's basically about laws and all that kind of stuff. So everything that you did last year. The stuff with asterisks against it is stuff that you might find interesting. You don't even have to open those sections if you don't want to, but they might give you a wee bit of help in just putting everything together and, and thinking about things. So they're there for you if you want to use them, but you're not uh, examined in them in that sense. That kind of general approach is in every section. So if I just go for this section at random, what you'll see is different headings. So there'll be things labelled core material. That's stuff that you need to do. So here it's the two lectures. It's stuff that we're going to do. It's stuff that you need to understand. It's stuff that you need to think about. Similarly, there will be supporting material. We'll look at that in the lectures. We probably won't cover every last page of it. But again, it's something that you need to know. So you need to understand this kind of stuff, why it's there, why it fits in. There will also be additional material. So that's stuff that will be helpful for you. But again, you don't have to do it and it's not it's not examinable in that sense. So it's there for you if you want some help. I'm going to jump over tutorial questions. I will come back to it. I'll tell you why that's there when I talk about the assessment. Finally, there's a section feedback on every one of these sections. This is anonymous feedback. It will take you less than 10 seconds to do. Because all it says is. All it says is. How much you understood the section. So basically what I want you to do after we've done each section is go there, tell me how you got on and it gives me an idea of whether I've managed to actually cover this or whether you're all just completely floundering. Mm -hmm. That said, you're all honour students. If you're floundering during the lectures, speak up. Tell me at the time, OK? I have pressed something, but it's just, I don't know what's up with middle. I think it's because we're back today. Everything's just so slow. OK, so you'll see that on every section. So there's the next one down. Core material, supporting material, tutorial questions, feedback. OK, same thing every time. OK, everyone happy with that for now? Yep. yep. OK. Yep. There's also a few introductory sections um, and one of the things you'll see in here is um, your favourite and mine, your ticky boxes. I know how you love to do these things. Um, it's partly so that I understand that you have gone through the things and it's partly because it, uh, I'm going to be honest with you, frankly it protects me. I have in the past I had students that said, oh, well, I didn't know this or I didn't know that or no one told me. Even though, for example, they're all in here. So what I ask you to do is just check them. I ask you just to go here and check the box to say, yep, I understand what's going on and I'll do it, I promise, gov. All right, so all you have to go do is go and check the box. Some of them you check the box yourself. Some of them when you access the bit of material, it will check it for you. So it's just for, again for me to give an idea on people engaging with uh, the, the module. 
because I want to catch that nice and early and make sure people are keeping up. For example, today there's some people haven't bothered to sign up for Teams and can't access this lecture. I'll need to have a chat with them and see what's happening while I'm bothered signing up for a module but that I'm actually going to attend. OK, so I've got a whole bunch of information in there. I'm not going to do it. You can read through it yourself and I would absolutely encourage you to do so. It's not massive. Just work your way through it. Understand what it is we're going to do. And um, what I'm hoping to get out of it. Or what I'm hoping you'll get out of it rather. So. Any questions before we go to the first lecture? No. 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 OK. So even the introductory lecture is uh, in the same format. There's core material, the supporting material, and there's additional material. I've also got in the introduction section um, some books that you might want to look at. Now, these are spectacularly expensive. I am not, I am not suggesting you run out and buy these. I don't know how easy it is for you just now to get into the library. I know it's a great pain for me, um, but some of them are uh, available electronically on the library. So they are worth a read. And if you have a spare couple of hundred of pounds, please feel free to buy them. But you don't require them, OK? So they're worth a read if you can get access to the library or you can get access to the electronic version. But I'm not saying go out and buy it. On the other hand, there's a whole bunch of other texts that you might find helpful that I've put up here. And actually, these ones are free. So have a look at them. If there's things that you think you might find interesting, they don't cost anything, so what's the worst that can happen with them? OK. Let us do that introduction then. Uh, also, just so that you know, I've got kind of three screens here. So you guys are up there. Mm -hmm. My control screen's down here, and the stuff that I'm showing you is up there. So you'll see me kind of going like this all the time. I'm not watching tennis. I'm just trying to understand what's going on. So I apologize <laughs> if I'm not kind of looking straight at you all the time. I'm just trying to keep up with all these things. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. So. As you know, you're signed up for a governance risk and compliance. It's 20 credits and lasts for this whole term. Anybody want to tell me what GRC actually is? Could it be an abbreviation? Uh, what's the words are? Governance no. risk and compliance. Yep. Yeah. Well, it is, yeah. So let me. Let me rephrase the question. Can anybody tell me what governance, risk and compliance actually is? To do with the laws surrounding what, what we're doing, cybersecurity and stuff. OK, so that specifically is in the compliance part. So that's mm -hmm. compliance with legislation. Any other bits from anybody? Um, maybe how to manage risk and um, when it comes to anything IT and what government uh, grows around risk and you know compliance. So every organization has risks and a responsible organization will try and understand what those risks might be. So it could be anything from um, someone launching a DOS attack on your network to uh, an unusual strain of a SARS virus that makes its way into the country and makes everyone stay at home for a year. 
<laughs> it can be anything between those. Mm. It could be as simple as uh, my network technician has left the job. Do we have enough staff to cover it? My uh, supplier of routers is Huawei and Donald Trump has decided that Huawei aren't allowed to, to sell anymore. So you'll have a list of things that are risks. Mm. Try to understand what they are and um, what you will do about them should they happen. What about the governance part? Probably some kind of governing board for the company, I'd imagine. That can be part of it. So usually the governing board is responsible for governance, but governance is a wee bit more um, involved in that. Um, the policies and things. Absolutely. So it's policies, how the how the organisation is run, how they think it should be run, hmm. what the what the proper way to do things is, if you like. So governance is the overall strategy, how the organisation is going to run. Risk is understanding current and future risks. And compliance is how you conform to rules and regulations. There's a fourth one in there called controls. Now, compliance is making sure that you conform to legislation, the laws of the land. So, for example, there may be a law that says if you sell something online you must accept returns up to 14 days mm -hmm. but you might decide actually to get a, a a steal on our competitors we will say no you've got a month to do it so that would be our control we've decided that for this particular thing it's going to be not the 14 days to comply with legislation, it's going to be 30 days, and that's what we want to do. So control and compliance are linked, partly because they tend to use the same sort of software to run these things. And of course, that's partly why you're getting this module as well. A lot of this stuff tends to fall on us. IT people, because there's a lot of software involved in, in making it run properly. So mm. it's about doing it for the stuff that we are doing, cyber security, networks, whatever it happens to be, but also providing that service for the rest of the organisation. And that's why you care. I mean, I think you should care because any knowledge is really helpful. But actually, you are going to be doing these things. IT doesn't exist just on its own. The days when um, people in IT could go, ah, it's too complicated, pal, just bung us some money, we'll sort it and uh, leave us alone. Those days are gone, yeah. sadly. <clears throat> I like those days. <laughs> IT is just another part of an organisation now. It's like HR or finance or shipping. It has to fit into the org how the organisation works and it has to be um, transparent with that as well. So IT has to understand how the organisation works. So you're going to have to understand how the organisation works because you don't live in a vacuum. So you have to understand the organisation, you have to understand wider society, so things like legislation, things like how changes are, are going to affect your business or your part of the business. And as I said, because we're in IT, IT systems are often responsible for recording these kinds of things, so you will actually be in charge of many of these systems when you get out into the big wide world. So there's a whole pile of reasons for having that. 
And of course, organisations are really keen to ensure that these things happen. Because they have legal responsibilities. If you run a company, and I suppose at this point I should digress because sometimes I say organisation, sometimes I say company. These things apply to all sorts of organisations. So it could be a business, it could be a charity, it could be a social enterprise, it could be anything. They all have to uh, conform to the same type of regulation. It might be slightly different depending on what organisation it is, but the way we'll look at it, you'll sometimes hear me say organisation, you'll sometimes hear me say business, sometimes charity. You can think of them all as one thing. Whoever runs any type of organisation has duties. And anybody who's involved in an organisation will understand that, even if you've been involved in your local, I don't know, your local scout group or your local dance group or your local judo club. You'll have somebody in there who collects the weekly fees. So you have financial responsibilities. If you don't collect the fees or you don't count them up properly or you lose some of them, there are. There is a, an issue there. Now, if it's your local judo club, the issue might be that all the other people that go to the club get upset at you and given that it's a judo club, that might be quite painful. If it's an organisation, your financial duties are based in legislation. So if you don't keep proper accounts, you can be prosecuted, you can be fined, you can go to jail. So not surprisingly, the people that run these organisations are really keen to ensure that uh, financial responsibilities are followed. You have other types of responsibilities as well. Fiduciary responsibilities. So those are responsibilities that say you have to look after the organisation before yourself. So to take an example purely at random, say for example that you run a government that suddenly requires lots of face masks. Your responsibility is to the government. Your responsibility is to get the best face masks you can at the best time you can, at the best price you can. What you shouldn't be doing is giving contracts to your mates or people who have donated to you because you know them. That sounds familiar. Purely random. I don't even know why it was in my head. <laughs> but any organisation has to do the same. You want to hire a window cleaner for your business? then you have to get the best window cleaning service. You can't just hire your brother-in-law because you happen to know him. You have to put the organisation before the individual. And as I say, if you don't do that, there may be actual criminal penalties, fines, jail time. And these run in all sorts of places, not just financial, it could be health and safety, it could be accounting, it could be anything at all. So if you're in charge of an organisation, you have to exercise a reasonable amount of uh, care when you do things. Now, reasonable is a great word. Reasonable doesn't mean things won't go wrong. And if you think back to when we did uh, professional computing practice, I made that point about health and safety. People have accidents. If someone falls off a ladder, that's an accident. If someone falls off a ladder where the ladder's been in good repair, the person that was up a ladder had training on how to go up a ladder. If they were strapped in and they were given the proper straps and there was somebody at the bottom of the ladder holding the ladder to make sure it didn't slip and all that kind of stuff, then if they fall off the ladder, it's an accident. And accidents happen. 
But if that person was sent out with a ladder with rotten rungs, if they were sent out on their own to clean a, a three-storey window and they fall off, that's your problem because you haven't taken proper care. And it's the same with uh, governance, risk and compliance. As long as you can have shown to have taken reasonable care, you can probably avoid going to prison. So as long as you put these systems in place and say, no, no well, we did this and we did this and we did this, but right at the end, somebody ran in and stole all the money, it happens. Let me give you an example of what I mean. There's an example from America where somebody who had been employed by a company had been let go. And because nobody in the company had thought to revoke their access privileges, they could still get access to all the company systems. They could get access to HR files, they could get access to accounting, they could delete files, they could do anything they wanted. Now, the person that did it was sent to prison 27 months and fined. But actually, the people that let them do it in the UK would be just as responsible. If you've got somebody that works for you and they've let go, where is your security measures? Where's your cyber security to say, are only the people who require access to the files given access to the files? So you wouldn't have taken reasonable care. And anything that went from that would be down to you and the organisation because you haven't taken reasonable care. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so let me give you another example. Say you are the director of a big company. And I mean a big company, the one I'm talking about, 500 uh, locations, thousands of employees. The question is, how do you um, ensure that everything's going well in all of those places? Who do you rely on? Where do you get your information? How do you know that the information's okay? Because the organisation I'm talking about is one you've probably heard of. Anybody ever been to a patisserie Valerie? Oh, no. There are fewer of them around since they had their problems, but you used to see them all the time in train stations and high streets and whatever. Think coffee and cake shop. Oh. Coffee, cake, sandwiches, that kind of thing. Um, The board of directors um, had to swiftly change things when they found out that their accounts were wrong and they had 120 million pounds less than they thought they had. Now, the, the chair tried to say it wasn't anything to do with him, Gov, honest. Somebody lied to him. A guy called Luke Johnson. What he said was, oh, well, my financial director gave me these accounts and told me um, everything was OK but there was actually an accounting fraud and 94 million pound black hole in the accounts. It actually went higher later. So he was, oh no, it wasn't me, it wasn't me. But let's think about what actually happened in that business. Yes, the director received a picture of the health of the business. It comes from the finance director. That's what they are. Uh, therefore, 
So the directors are responsible for that organization. They're responsible for the governance of the organization. And they got, and let's be generous and call it a misstated series of accounts. However, those accounts came from the finance director. And the only person responsible for creating those accounts, checking those accounts, having anything to do with those accounts, was the finance director. So in this organisation, with hundreds of locations, with thousands of employees, had said, yeah, we are going to trust every single piece of financial information to this one person. Technically, that's a risk. And any halfway competent board would never have allowed that to happen. And again, I go back to things that you may have been involved in. If your local judo club wants to buy some new mats, you don't just give somebody some cash and say on you go. You look for receipts. You make sure that two people have checked them. You audit them. See, I used to run, we used to run a girls club and we were exactly the same. You had to have two signatories to yep. pass money and stuff. Yep. Back when we had checkbooks, you had to have two signatories to every check mm -hmm. to make sure that somebody wasn't just paying themselves. But this big company thought, nah, it's OK. He's my mate. I went to school with him. He won't do anything. So technically, that was a risk. And because they took that risk and because their accounts were falsified and because they submitted those accounts, and if you're a company, you have a legal ob obligation to create accounts and file them with company's house so that people know uh, about the financial health of your company, they actually broke the law. So it didn't have compliance with the law. So there in one snapshot is what we are looking at. Governance failed because they didn't identify a risk. The risk wasn't dealt with, so the company failed in its legislative compliance. In this case, it was about money, but it could be anything. So what we'll look at is how all these things fit together, and they do fit together. There's not just different silos in different parts of the organisation, or at least there shouldn't be. The governance fits into risk because the board should have an understanding of what risks that organisation faces. So you wouldn't necessarily expect the board to go away and identify what the risks are, but you'd expect someone in the organisation to identify those and feed them back to the board so that the board could understand the issues and make choices depending on those risks that have been identified. Uh, we have a risk that there's a potential denial of service. Should we be subject to that? our systems would be down until that denial of service attack faded. OK. What would be the outcome of that? Well, the company would lose millions of pounds because we couldn't get access to our systems, we couldn't get access to sales or anything else. OK, what can we do about it? We can put in, and you'll know the mitigation, so I'm not going to those. Fine, how much will it cost? So you have a risk. You say what might happen if that risk comes to pass. You say how you can mitigate it and what it costs. Then it's up to the board to say yes or no. If the denial of service, if to, to mitigate denial of service would cost a company a hundred pounds, do it. If mitigation of denial of service cost them a hundred thousand pounds, oh well. OK, so what are the risks? How often might it happen? What would be the downside? So it's about trying to understand what might happen, what the cost would be and what you're going to do about it. So there's a continual back and forth here between 
and I just realized I was pointing to things on my screen rather than in your screen. There's a continual back and forth here between governance and risk. Those in the organization identify the risks, feed it back in. Same sort of thing with compliance. What is it that we have to comply with? Um, a government decides to implement Brexit. All of a sudden, there's a whole pile of new regulations. What is it we have to do? You wouldn't necessarily expect the board to understand every part of everything that could happen, but you would expect all the business units to understand those and feed them back in so that the, the, the board could understand what the issues were. So you have this whole loop here as risk and compliance and governance all fit together to try to ensure that you get the best outcome for your organisation. Questions? Mm. Don't have any. No, nope, no. Nope. Seem reasonable? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, one thing I know is that uh, people can only listen to a lecture for a certain amount of time. And that counts in real life as well as this. And actually doing it this way around, um, you actually have less ability to concentrate. So what I will try and do when we're doing these things is take regular breaks. So with your agreement, what we'll do is we'll take a break. How long would you like? How long would you like? 15 minutes, 10 minutes. 10, 15, you tell me. Let's go 15. 15. 15 minutes, got a deal. I'll see you back here in 15 minutes. Thanks, folks. Thank you.
Right, welcome back. It's amazing how long it takes to make a cup of tea. I don't know about you, but I've only just finished. Okay. Anybody have any questions from the first part of the lecture that have occurred to them? No. 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 No, happy. Remember, there's also the meeting chat, so if you have anything, feel free to stick it in there. All right, now if there's nothing else for the moment, I am going to talk about the assessments. Not that you'll care about those, of course, because you just want to learn for the sake of learning. You're less interested in the assessment, right? OK. There is one assessment. One report with all of the marks. It is based on a case study. So like I said, everything is here right from the start. So in the assessments section, <clears throat> there is your case study. There's your very slow case study. Is everybody this slow this morning? Is it my connection? I've got another three people sitting on the internet. My two grandkids are here and they're at school and my boys at college, so my internet's not the best. Yeah, my daughter's at university at the moment, so she's taking it. And I think my wife's working downstairs. Just sometimes Moodle goes slow and I wasn't sure if it was that or not. Anyway. Tony, you're putting the marking scheme up. The link's expired. All oh, right, OK, I'll sort that, sorry. The marking schemes on a. On a shared Excel document. And for some reason, when you share a document on OneDrive, it expires after eight weeks. That's the maximum you can give it. All right. So every so often I have to just reshare it so that it can be redone. So yeah, OK, I'll update that. My apologies. So there's a case study. It's a very simple case study. It's just page of A4. And it's about a community development trust. So if anybody doesn't know, a community development trust is basically a social enterprise, a social company. It's, it's, uh, it's kind of like a company, but it works for the benefit of the local community. But it has to be set up in the same way. So that you have to keep accounts and you have to have a board and all that kind of stuff. Not surprisingly, because it is a community thing, there's not a, a complete set of information. Not everybody understands everything that's required, which is why they've employed you as a governance, risk and compliance expert. What you need to do is tell them how to set up these structures, how to set up their governance, how to understand and manage risks. What sort of legislative issues they may come across and how they can deal with them. OK, so that's your report. In essence, Everything that's going to come up under the sections should be in your report. 
Okay so far? Yep. Yep. So what you will do... Oh man, it's so slow. <laughs> I can just see the wee thing. There we go. I'm not sure if it's actually worse when I can see the wee thing just kind of going round and round. <laughs> So, you have to look at the case study, you have to understand what it is they do, and you're going to produce, in essence, two documents. So it's one big report, but it's two documents. <coughs> the first document is the, um, the summary, if you like. This is what you should do. So say, for example, you might decide that they have an issue with GDPR compliance. You might want to say in your report that um, you require proper structures for GDPR and you'll need to do this and that and the other, whatever it happens to be. So that's the executive summary to say that there's an issue, what the issues are, and you need to refer back to the case study to say what they might be. So that anybody can read it. But there's a second part to the document. I don't care how you think of it, whether it's an appendix or whether it's just an extension to the document or whether it's a different document. The idea is if someone who has read the executive summary wants to understand more about why you've made those recommendations, why you've decided to do this on GDPR, they will be able to go to the appendix where you'll have explained what GDPR is. You'll have explained the responsibilities that it confers upon organisations and the kind of actions that they need to do. So the first one is a kind of business report, or the first part is a kind of business report, and all the other parts are more of a an academic report. So you have to follow proper academic practice, you have to reference it, um, and hopefully you've all done all the referencing and stuff. If not, there's a referencing guide on Moodle here. OK, so you need those two parts. The overall, read this and you understand what you'll have to do. And the second bit that says this is why you have to do it. Does that make sense? Yep. 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 OK. You will also see there a whole bunch of things that you will certainly want to have in the report. No doubt you will come up with others, but you will definitely need those. How you structure it is up to you, but you might want to think about um, having a separate section for possibly each of the sections that I've done here, something like that. But again, it's up to you. It's your report. You're the consultant, you need to decide what the best thing is to do. You will be helped in that. Then I notice how much slower I get when I'm speaking when I'm trying to bring something else up on my screen. <laughs> Was I covering it? Not really. <laughs> you can blame it on your internet connection. Yeah, it was internet connection, you're right. Aye. Uh, there's the thing that's not linked. I will link it up later, but there's the marking scheme. So you can get an idea of, of uh, the sections that you are definitely going to need. And that includes things like how you present the report. Because remember, you've got three months to do this. 
I'm doing this as a, a genuine business report. So if I was in this position, which I have been, I'll be looking for a report that is actually something that I would expect from an actual consultant. So I don't want you throwing something together and hoping for the best. Sorry, Nicola. And no, I just says, mm hmm. Yeah. Um, so presentation is part of that. And how it all fits together is part of that. So a proper professional report. Um, anybody any questions about that marking scheme? I'm sure we'll figure out what SL and COVID are. Sorry, Joshua, you're very quiet. I don't know if you're far away from the mic. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, I'm assuming we'll find out what ethyl and COVID are later. You're assuming what, sorry? What line 10 and 11 are later. Yeah, yeah. So, um, like I said, everything's available on Moodle from day one. So 9, 10, 11 are control, ITIL and COBIT. And if I go down here, I happen to know that COBIT and ITIL are IT specific frameworks. And there's a whole section for control. So yeah, we will be doing it. I don't expect you to know what all these things are on day one, clearly. Tony, is that okay. a word count or have you, is that on the, the assessment? I've not read it. No word count. Anybody want to say why? Why? You can, if, if you don't have enough information, <laughs> you'll just add stuff in to try and bulk it up. And if you've got too much information, you could cut out important things just to try and condense it into the word count. Yep. Hmm. And like I said, I'm expecting a professional report. I'm expecting the kind of report that I would get in real life. I wasn't always a lecturer. I used to have a real job. <laughs> so I know what I'm doing. <laughs> Be sure to tell all your other lecturers that. <clears throat> I'm looking for something that I would get in real life. And nobody, but nobody, comes up to you in real life and says, um, can you write me a report on denial of service attacks and uh, keep it within 1400 words, please? Mm. The report should be as long as it's as is required to explain everything, mm -hmm. but not so long that you hide all the information in there. <clears throat> so, the word count is entirely up to you. Sorry? What if it's short? straight and direct to the point and every single thing you are looking for is in there. Great. <laughs> that's exactly what I want. OK, because that's what I want in real life. Tony, how, do, how does uh, the classes work then if everything's like online? So what would like be happening like uh, week two is like class? Like what would you be going over? Just uh, wondering about that. I will come to that, so I'll leave that just now. I'll yeah, yeah. That in a wee minute. OK. So any other questions about that marking scheme? Mm. No. Oh. Nah, that's fine. OK. So. What I am. I was going to say suggesting, but I'm not suggesting it. I'm telling you. Start working in your report now. Continue working on your report now. And it's exactly what I was just saying to Josh, what we'll be doing. So every week we will have a lecture and we'll talk about. And again, there won't be any surprises for you. We're basically going to work through it in the order that it's there. So next week, when we come in, the first thing we are going to do is look at governance. Because that's the first lecture there. Actually, if you run through these things. Oops. You can kind of see what we'll be doing on every week. Mm -hmm. Week one, week two. Week three, mm -hmm. week four. 
week five, week six, you get the idea. Mm -hmm. All right. So you'll come in. You will get the lecture. We'll talk about everything that's going on. And I did say I would come back to these quizzes. So what you'll do for the rest <coughs> of the time that we have is you'll work on this quiz slash your report. The idea with this quiz, and it is a quiz, I'm not going to mark it. The idea with the quiz. timers on them, Tony. No timers, no. <laughs> <laughs> not, not that kind of quiz. That was last year's. <laughs> not that kind of quiz. So it's not an assessment. It's not It's not something I'm going to check on unless you ask me to. What I want you to do is look at the questions and those kinds of questions are firstly the sort of knowledge that I expect you to take out of what you're doing and therefore not surprisingly the sort of thing that, you know, might want to go into some sort of consultant's report that you might be producing. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. this is a kind of more detailed version of the marking scheme, if you like. It's the sort of things that I know that I will be looking for in your report. Cool. OK. This one won't make any sense to you because I haven't done it yet. But next week we'll talk about a pyramid diagram. You'll tell we'll talk about the layers and why they're there. Come on. <laughs> the joys. Explain why a board should receive comprehensive and timious corporate reports. One access, one aspect of a governance framework might be procedures for proper supervision, control and information flows for checks and balances. So that's the kind of stuff that relates to the kind of stuff we were talking about earlier that um, somebody writes, if somebody says we'll spend some money, someone else might want to check that you actually do need to spend that money and where it's going to. Mm. OK, so these are these are things that will help you um, understand the kind of things that I'm hoping you'll take out of it and it will then feed into your report. So the time that we'll have, you'll have the chance to go through these. Like I say, I'm not marking these, but what it lets you do is say, Tony, can you look at question five? Um, have a look at what I've put and tell me if that's what you were thinking of. Cool. All right, so if there's anything you're not sure about, it lets you come back to it and I can I can help you out in that way. That makes sense? Yep. Yep. All right. So you'll see these in all the sections. That's a good wee guide. So it is. OK, so there was a governance one. There's a risk one. Same kind of idea. Mm -hmm. There's a control one. Yep. You'll notice there isn't one for COVID and ITIL. And that probably represents the fact that each of them is worth 5% of your report. So that's that's the kind of setup, and it's also how hopefully you'll be able to uh, do your report. And like I say, I'm not requesting you start work immediately. I'm telling you, OK? And I'm not <coughs> telling you because I hate you, because I don't know you well enough to hate you. You know, we'll get there, no <laughs> doubt. I'm telling you because that's the best way to do it. As you get further on in this term, you'll have other things to do. You don't want to get to, you know, a week before it's due in and suddenly think, oh, I better start writing up this stuff. Mm -hmm. 
And I'm actually going to, I'm not going to tell you who it was. I'm going to read you a, a student email from last year. Um, I'm struggling a bit with the deadline in this report. Although it was a generous amount of time, I had to work a lot more than I imagined over the last few weeks, which is the time I allocated to myself to do the work. That's a student from last year who didn't work on it as we went through it, waited till the end and then everything just got on top of them. Not only can you work on this as we go along, so you're pretty much there by the time we get to the end of the term. If you want, you can work ahead. Everything's on Moodle, nothing's hidden. So if you want to, if you have extra time, feel free to, to work ahead and start doing other things so that you've got a head start so that when you've got your other stuff due in, you're sitting back going, well, thank goodness I finished that nice and early. Yep. Mm -hmm. Sounds like a good idea. Yeah. So we'll do stuff every week. Once we've finished the lecture, I will be here to answer questions, to give advice. In essence, the second part is student led. It's whatever you want to do. So the quiz is there, but I'm not going to go over the quiz. But I will answer questions on the quiz. The assessment's there, but I'm not going to go over the assessment, but I will answer questions on the assessment. You get the idea. Submission day isn't shown on Moodle. I will put it up, but in essence, it is going to be the last day of term. OK, if you go through all those lectures you will find that they take us to week 11. So basically we've well, got to week 11, you have done everything and it should all be due in the next week. <clears throat> so shortly I will work out what that actually means and And I will put on the submission link, which seems to be missing at the moment. Let it go. OK, I'll put that up within the next week. If I don't put it up, shout at me. Tell me that I haven't done it. Um, but it's just exactly what you'd expect. A turn it in link for your report. I'll also update that marking guide. Your appendices have to be written in an academic manner. So you have to do all the um, all the referencing and all that kind of stuff, just exactly as you do for other um, other modules. I did say I wanted a professional report. There is a tool. Most of you will know things like checking your spelling and grammar in Word, and I'm assuming that you're going to do that. But there's also something called Designer, which you might not have come across. So I've put a link to how to use Designer. What it does is it looks through your document and just tries to make it pretty, if you like. So if it's quite helpful if you've maybe got a wee report that's a wee bit bitty, you know, different wee bits here and there, not looking their best. It'll just take you through and, and give you suggestions, and they are just suggestions in the same ways that it will give you suggestions on um, spelling or whatever. So you don't have to accept them, but it might help you. Finally, my emails on Moodle. I am not accepting questions on the case study via email. Any questions on this case study must come to the case study discussion forum. OK, 
Very simply because I want there to be one place where if you ask a question, I've given the answer and everybody can see it. Mm -hmm. So I don't want anybody sort of taking something different from it. It means that if anybody has a question, everybody can see the question, everybody can see the answer. And if my answer is not that helpful, it means everybody can jump in and go, well, what did you mean by? OK, so <coughs> when come up, email to do with the case study, I'll ignore, stick it in here instead. OK, is that all clear? <coughs> yep. Yeah. So I'll update the marking scheme and I'll update the turn it in date, as I say, last day of term in essence. As you've already seen from the marking scheme and how Moodle set up, the report should cover all of those sections. And you can check for the waiting. Create your executive summary and then create and it's up to you how you want to present it. It might be one document. It might be a bunch of appendices. So that might be helpful if you're doing it as we go through it week by week. You can actually create an appendix every week, which you then knit together at the end to create your final executive report or you know, whatever. But you have to create it and you have to give recommendations to the board to say, do this, do this, do this. Do this and you'll be fine. The appendix must con must explain the concepts. So like I say, these people who are setting up their development trust don't know anything about this. The appendix must be comprehensive enough that if you say something like, um, you must have a risk register, you'll be able to go to the appendix and go, well, what is a risk register? What should be on there? How should it look? All that kind of thing. And of course, you will have created a, a sample risk register for them. And that's on the that's on Moodle. It's something you have to do as well. So the idea is that can stand on its own. You shouldn't have to come back to you and go, what did you mean by, yay, there's a dog. Come on, get one camera. <laughs> I want to see the dog. That's mine, sorry. <laughs> I apologise, just get one camera. My camera's not even working. <laughs> I'm waiting on a new one coming. So, like I said earlier, no word limit. You take exactly the amount of words that you need to explain. No more, no less. And don't forget, I will be looking at presentation and referencing this 20% of the whole marks on those two things. <coughs> so it's probably a good idea to, you know, actually make a nice looking report. Don't give me an excuse to cut down. That's 10% just without knowing anything about governance, risk and compliance. It's probably a good idea to check how UWS references things and follow it. Because there's another 10% without knowing anything about governance, risk and compliance. So that's you halfway to passing without actually knowing anything. <laughs> I'm not kidding. That's the not way the marking scheme works. <laughs> so don't give up marks. Because things like reference, well, I hate referencing. If I'm honest, I don't even attempt to understand referencing. <laughs> All I do is whenever I need to reference, I go and follow the style guide and I do what it tells me. I've been doing this for years and I do I, I just I've given up trying to figure out where I should bold and where I should italicize and where I should underline and what order everything is, because life's too short. I go to the style guide, I figure out which one it is that I'm going to be doing. And I copy it. Uh, 
So there is a guide to referencing there, but actually the bit I like is this. Collection of referencing examples. Because I go here, I figure out that I want to quote, I want to reference a book. And it tells me how to do it both in the reference list. That's the order, that's the bit that you underline and it shows you how to do it within the report itself. And like I say, I've given up trying to remember it. I just follow the rules. So now that one said Harvard referencing. Yeah. We've been told that UWS has moved to cite them, right? So yep. what one would you prefer us to follow? Can you ask me that question again <laughs> afterwards, please? <laughs> <laughs> no bother. For the tape, I am going to check what I need. I'll ask me later. <laughs> okay, so get your presentation right, get your referencing right. Usual threshold, 40% to pass, but you should be going to higher. There's no reason you can't get a really good mark in this because everything's there. It's just taking it, writing it down. So make sure you don't just skip over all the stuff before you get to the material. Read the stuff about what it is I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. You know, those sections that talked about. Um, those sections that talked about how to engage with it and what's in it and what you need to do beforehand, read those because actually really helpful in terms of understanding what it is we're looking for. Things like the learning outcomes and stuff. Use all that. Game the system. So everything's in there. Make sure you complete everything. If you haven't completed things, you'll get emails from me or Teams meetings saying, is everything OK? Because it is as much for you as it is for me. Make sure you keep up and that will give you a, a guide to whether you're keeping up or not. Turn up. I will be recording these and I will make them available uh, on line. I paused there because it used to be on Microsoft Streams. They may be changing that. I'm not quite sure, but I'll, I'll give you a link on Teams to wherever they end up in the end. If you're not engaging, if you're not doing stuff, I'm, I'll remove you. OK. So please come along, do the stuff. If you don't understand anything, ask and please ask there and then. Sorry, did somebody say something there? No. No, it's maybe somebody outside actually. Um, if you don't understand anything, just ask me. That's what I'm here for. We've got plenty of time. Ask the question there and then. Don't wait until a month later and go, remember at half past 11, three and a half weeks ago, you said, because I won't. Trust me, I won't. So we've got time to discuss things. You can't ask me what's the answer to this assessment question. So try and figure out how you're going to ask the question without me just giving you the answer to the assessment, which I'm not allowed to do. Questions? None yet. No, nah, none yet. No. What's the answer to the assessment? Pardon? <laughs> What's the answer to the assessment? What's the vote for the assessment? The answer. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> the silence there gave you your answer, Tafi. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, I know. That's, <laughs> that's a fantastic question, Tafi. I just, <laughs> just can't answer it. Anything else? Mm, nah. Nothing yeah, like everyone else has said. 
OK, if there's no questions, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop the recording.